Amen. Please be seated. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Please remain standing. Remain standing now for the reading of God's Word. I'll be reading from Revelation chapter 4, Genesis chapter 9, as we continue the series that we've been in in the book of Genesis, or we sometimes call it the gospel of Genesis. And so, Revelation chapter 4 and Genesis chapter 9. Let's hear now God's word. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne, in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, the third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to Him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before Him who sits on the throne and worship Him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for You created all things, and by Your will they exist and were created." Turn now to Genesis chapter 9. As we continue our series within a series, we've been looking at God's covenant with Noah, and we happen to be now in the third in that series, titled the sermon this morning, The Real Meaning of the Rainbow, The Real Meaning of the Rainbow. Let's look at Genesis chapter 9, beginning at verse 8. I'll be reading from verse 8 to 17. Then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And as for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth. Thus I establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood." Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant which is between me and you. And every living creature of all flesh, the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God abides forever. Please be seated as we pray. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Father, how we thank you for this precious portion of your word which we have come to in your providence this morning. 
And for all those who are gathered here this morning to hear these things, we pray, O Lord, that you would open all of our ears, and opening our ears, that you would open our hearts, not only to see the things that you did long ago in the days of Noah, but to see how all of these things point us to our faithful Savior, our comfort, our hope, the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, O Lord, that you would shine the light of his glory upon us as we live our lives in this world under the light and glory of your rainbow, of your covenant. We thank you, O Lord, that you have given us an understanding of what you have done, that you have taught us in your word what these things mean, that you have interpreted for us the sign of the rainbow. And we ask you, Lord, that you would now use it to point us to Christ and to give us hope in him. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, what do you think of when you see a rainbow? Rainbows come in many different shapes and sizes. Some are full arcs. Some are less than that. Some of the most beautiful rainbows that I've ever seen have been in Brazil, where there's a tropical uh, climate and where uh, my family sometimes goes because uh, my wife is from there. And when you look at some of those rainbows, you are just amazed and astonished at the wonder of not only what God has done in creation, but if you really understand what the rainbow means, you are astonished at what he's done in history for his people. What is a rainbow? Well, if you were to ask someone who studies such things, you would you would be told that a, a rainbow is a multicolored spectrum of light caused by the reflection, refraction, and dispersion of light in drops of water in the air. That's what you would hear. That's what a rainbow is. But the question for us, I think, is what is the rainbow? What does the rainbow mean? What does the sign of the rainbow mean? And so what does it mean to the unbelieving world? We might start there. What does it mean? to the unbelieving world. Go through any of the neighborhoods in which we live, we might see someone flying a flag, and some of those flags that we see are flags that have the colors of the rainbow on them. Whenever I see such a flag, I try to remember to tell my children what that sign or what that symbol ought to be pointing us to rather than what it is often meant by the unbelieving world. The unbelieving world has adopted that symbol, interestingly, has adopted that symbol to mean something like diversity, tolerance, autonomy, and even rebellion, taking pride in things that God has condemned in his word. That's not the meaning of the rainbow. That is the co-opted meaning of the rainbow. That's uh, blasphemy against God. That's rebellion against God. What does the rainbow really mean? What does it mean to those with believing eyes? Well, to those with believing eyes, and we'll see this as we, as we look at this passage, the rainbow signifies God's covenant, God's covenant that he made with Noah, a covenant that, is, that sits squarely in the administration of the covenant of grace, the, the larger covenant made with Christ and his seed, and so each of the covenants in the Old Testament, we've already looked at this, the covenant made with Adam that, he would, uh, that God would send, put enmity between uh, the woman and the seed, the seed of the woman, the seed of the serpent, that God would uh, send a savior, that God would send a, a deliverer. There was a covenant made with Adam and Eve even after they sinned. There's a covenant now made with Noah. There's a covenant later made with Abraham. There's a covenant made with uh, Moses. There's a covenant made with David. And ultimately, there's a covenant, the everlasting covenant made with the Lord Jesus Christ. But all of those other covenants are administrations of that greater covenant of grace. And that's what we want to understand when we look at God's covenant with Noah here in Genesis chapter 9. Three things that we need to understand about this covenant, and we'll see that as we look at this passage. First of all, it's a sovereign covenant. God is the one who establishes it. God is the one who maintains it. God is the one who graciously enters into it. It's not a covenant made by man with God. It's a covenant made by God with man. It's a gracious covenant. Man clearly does not deserve for God to enter into a covenant with him. 
God has destroyed the whole earth. He's, he's looked at one man and the household of one man, and he has found one person in the whole earth upon which to shine the light of his grace. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But it wasn't anything that Noah did. Noah himself, as we'll see, uh, as we continue in this narrative, uh, we'll see that Noah himself is a sinner. And so Noah has no reason to think that he deserves anything from God. This is a gracious covenant. It's also a perpetual covenant, a perpetual covenant. It's, it's a covenant made with Noah, made with his seed, his descendants, and, and really a covenant that is made with the whole earth. God is making a promise to the whole earth that he is going to continue the seasons and harvest. He's going to continue everything in an orderly way. The sun is going to rise. The, the moon is going to come out. The, the, all of the orderly processes of the natural world, the created world, all of those things are going to continue as God has designed them to do, and God is not going to send a flood of judgment over the whole earth again. He's promising to maintain the world and life in it for the sake of of Noah and his descendants for the sake of the covenant people. And so we're going to see two things, Lord willing, as we look at this portion of Scripture. First, we're going to see God's sovereignty in the covenant of grace. And second, we're going to see God's faithfulness in the covenant of grace, that faithfulness signified in the rainbow. Well, let's look first at God's sovereignty in the covenant of grace. And Really, the first thing that I want to direct your attention to here under God's sovereignty in the covenant of grace is God's establishment of his covenant with Noah. Noah is the covenant head, and God is establishing his covenant with Noah, but also with those who are connected covenantally to Noah, his household as well. And so let's look here at Genesis chapter 9. I want to review the context just for a moment. There are a number of visitors here with us this morning, so many of you have not been with us. Right now, we're in Genesis chapter 9. We've seen how God sent a flood of judgment throughout the whole earth. The whole earth was flooded. This is something that God himself did in history. God is a God who acts in history. These are historical events. God judged the whole earth, and one family, Noah and his household, were delivered through the ark. And then as they... As, as God graciously brought them to brought them uh, brought the waters of the flood down and set that ark on the mountains of Ararat, they left the ark and Noah built an altar. The first thing that he did was he worshipped his God, and then it says in chapter nine verse one, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, "Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth." And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth, on every bird of the air, and on all that move on the earth, and on all the fish of the sea, they are given into your hand. God reminds Noah of the original creation mandate that he had given to Adam and Eve. And God graciously sets Noah back into a relationship with himself and enables him to live in this world as uh, in covenant with God. And so... The, 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 the context here is God's blessing of Noah and his family. But then the next thing that we read in verse 8 is this. Then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him. And what did he say? As for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you. God speaks to Noah and his sons. And, and this is something that's come up again and again in our uh, as we've gone through the book of Genesis, God is a speaking God. God is a God who has made us for fellowship and communion with himself. And so he made us in his own image that we might receive revelation from God, that we might be in communion with him. He made us in his own image in order that he might communicate with his creature, man. God's great desire in the covenant is to communicate Often when I'm speaking with husbands and wives or those who hope to be married, I will say something and maybe spend a great deal of time talking about communication because communication in marriage is very, very important. And what I remind people of is that God is a God who speaks. He communicates, and he wants us to communicate with one another, not only in marriage but also in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Communication 
is important. And God's great desire in the covenant is that he would communicate himself and all the blessedness of being in communion with God. More than the blessedness that Adam and Eve had in the garden. God's desire is that he's going to communicate an even greater blessedness than that in the new heavens and the new earth. And that's why he sends his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into the world because God desires to communicate himself and he does so in his son in the flesh. And God speaks in order to reassure mankind at this point. Think about it. If you're coming off of the ark, you've just seen the entire world destroyed by a flood and... You could have in your mind some trepidation about life in this world. And so what does God do? He graciously reassures mankind, beginning with Noah. He reassures mankind that God will fulfill his purpose for man on the earth. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. That is going to happen. Not because man deserves it, but because God is a gracious God who enters into covenant And so he enters into this covenant with Noah, with his household, and by extension with the whole earth. Now, remember, this too is a reflection of what happened in the Garden of Eden because God gave Adam dominion over all creation. And when Adam fell, the whole creation fell as well. There's a a connection. There's a connection between the, the head of the covenant and the whole creation. We ought to remember that as we think of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the head of all creation and who is the head of all creation for his church. And so God speaks to all mankind through Noah. Noah's descendants are going to be joint heirs with him of a new creation. Noah's descendants are going to be descendants with him of a new creation. If you turn with me to Isaiah 54... Read in verse 9. This is like the waters of Noah to me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be angry with you nor rebuke you. For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from you, nor shall my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has mercy on you. God is a covenant-making and a covenant-keeping God. And this covenant that God makes with all creation through Noah is really but a dim reflection of the greater covenant. In fact, this is an administration of that covenant. It's pointing us beyond the the natural order, beyond the things that are happening in the, the natural world. It's pointing us to a new heavens and a new earth, which is promised to the people of God. And so God is a speaking God. He speaks in order to reveal His purposes in history, verse 9. He speaks in order to reveal the centrality of the covenant in His plan of redemption. Now, a covenant sometimes is thought of as an agreement between God and man. It's really far more than that. And here we see a unilateral covenant. God is making a, a covenant It's not up to, the covenant is not going to be maintained by by man's activity. This is a unilateral covenant. God is saying, I will do this. I will do this because I am who I am. I will do this because I am God and because I have a plan. I have a plan for history. And I'm going to maintain life in this world. I'm going to maintain it because I have a larger plan, the plan of redemption. I'm going to send my son into the world to redeem mankind. The word word establish here means to ratify, to confirm. God is ratifying or confirming an existing covenant. This is not the first time that this covenant is mentioned. It's mentioned already. We've already seen it mentioned in in chapter 8. God has entered into a covenant, entered into a covenant with Adam, and this is the second unfolding of covenant history, the second big division of covenant history that I mentioned to you in the last two sermons in this series. And God, has, God is ratifying, He's confirming an existing covenant, a covenant that points ultimately to the Lord Jesus Christ. The connection here is to the original creation mandate. God says in verse 10, 
and with every living creature. So I will make, I, I establish my covenant with you and your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you of all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth. God is, uh, God is establishing his covenant. He's ratifying, he's confirming an existing covenant. There's a connection to the original creation mandate, but it's looking forward to a new creation. God is the God of every living creature. He's made all things, and He is He He has uh, reestablished that that uh, original dominion mandate that was given to Adam. He's He's confirming that again with Noah. There's an administration here of the covenant of grace. He says, "You and your descendants, or you and your seed." That's a feature of all of the covenants, all of the administrations of the covenant of grace. God is a God who enters into covenants with us and with our children, as we heard last Sunday night. God confirms his determination here to sustain his creation for the sake of his plan of redemption, and one of the means that he's going to use is the simple means of procreation. And this is why he tells Noah and his household to be fruitful and to multiply, just as he told Adam and Eve. All of this is by the sovereign initiative of God. I will establish, I will do this. Verse 11, I establish my covenant. Verse 9, I should say. And I establish my covenant. And verse 11, I establish my covenant with you. The sovereign initiative of God. God is a king, and he is the one who enters into this covenant. Matthew Henry says that all of God's covenants are of his own making. And that's what we see here. It's a sovereign covenant. And when God makes a covenant, not only is it sovereign, it is also gracious. It's by way of condescension. God stoops down. God comes down. The only way, our our confessional standards say, the only way that we can have any relationship with God is if God were to stoop down, to come down to us by way of covenant. It's a condescending love that he enters into here. Well, secondly, God's promise is to Noah and all creation. God's promise is to Noah and to all creation. So God's, God established his covenant with Noah, but God's promise is to Noah and all creation. And what does he say? He says, never again will all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Now, this again, we've already seen this, but this again proves that the flood was universal in scope. It was global in, in scope. I know the world around us would scoff and mock at that idea, but this this flood was universal and global in scope, and, and, and the term all flesh proves it. All flesh. He's, he, he's saying, never again will I do what I've done. Now, if it were true, as some say, that this was a local flood confined to a local area, then this promise has not come to pass, because often, many times, there have been floods that have cut off much flesh. But he's saying, never again will all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. It proves that the flood was universal and global in scope. To be cut off here means to be excommunicated, to be condemned. And that language is going to be used again and again throughout the scriptures. To be cut off means to be judged. God's promise is never again to judge the whole world by means of a global flood. Man needed that reassurance at that time. We need that reassurance. We need that reassurance that God is going to continue the natural course of things throughout history for the sake of his covenant purposes in Jesus Christ. That he is going to bring all to repentance that he has determined that he will bring to repentance. And so God will preserve man's life. He will preserve the entire creation for man's life. He establishes, he ratifies this covenant with a promise And when God makes a promise, he always causes his promise to come to pass. God has a sovereign, gracious purpose for preserving all life. And that purpose will be further unfolded in each generation and in each successive administration of the covenant. This is what you and I need to be thinking about every time we see a rainbow. Because none of us deserves the least of God's mercies. But he sustains our lives in this world because he has promised to be a God to us. 
to be a God to our children after us and to save us through faith in Jesus Christ. And he has a purpose for us as witnesses in this world to speak of Christ to those who don't know Christ. God is sustaining the world, not because the world deserves to be sustained, but because God has a purpose and a plan in history. Let's look now at God's faithfulness in the covenant of grace. God's faithfulness in the covenant of grace. And there's a sign here that God gives. It's the sign of God's covenant. It's the sign of the rainbow. Whenever God establishes a covenant, do you know what he does? He authenticates that covenant, that promise with a sign. He authenticates it with a sign and a seal. He says that I have said this, and here's the proof that I have spoken in history. It's a feature of all of God's covenants. Throughout the Old Testament, miracles are called signs. Circumcision is called the sign of the covenant, Genesis 17. The Sabbath is called a sign of the covenant, Exodus 31. God gives signs when he enters into covenants with man. The sign of this covenant is the rainbow. Look with me at verses 12 to 13. God said, this is the sign of the covenant, which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you, For perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud, and I, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. The sign of this covenant is the rainbow. This is God's rainbow. This is God's sign. It's God's covenant. It's a sign given by God. And so it can't be appropriated by man to communicate something that man wants to communicate. It's a sign given by God. It's a sign given by God in perpetuity. Verse 12, I make, uh, the, this is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. As long as the earth remains, as long as there's seed time and harvest, as, as long as the sun rises in the sky, this covenant will continue. God is making a promise. God is making a promise that the, that the world that we live in is going to continue as long as God has a purpose. That should comfort our hearts right now when there's such great upheaval and perplexity in the world around us. And we say, what's going on in the world? What's happening? What's going to happen? Well, we know one thing. God is going to bring his purposes to pass in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. His kingdom cannot be shut down, and his kingdom is going to be built And so it's a sign given by God. It's a sign given by God in perpetuity. It's a sign not only given, but it's a sign interpreted by God, verses 14 through 16. And so God says, It shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. It's a sign not only given, but a sign interpreted by God. He tells us what it means. He tells us. We don't have to look to the world for the meaning of the sign. The world has appropriated that sign to mean something exactly contrary and exactly opposite to what God has said That sign is God's sign. That rainbow, whenever we see it, ought to remind us of the faithfulness of God. What does the sign communicate, not only to us, but what does the sign communicate to us about God? Well, first of all, it says that God is the sustainer of man's life in this world. We need to remember that. God is the sustainer of our life in this world. That's why when we pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, we also pray Give us this day our daily bread. God is the sustainer of our lives in this world. His covenant is with all creation, verse 12, verses 15 to 16. His covenant is with the whole creation. This particular covenant, this administration of the covenant is a covenant that is made with all creation, but it's for the sake of his purposes in redemption. His covenant is for the sake of man. His covenant is for the sake of his image bearer, God is sustaining man's life in this world because man is made for eternal fellowship and communion with God in the world to come. And so the purpose of this covenant 
is not to sustain man's life in this world in sin forever. The purpose of this covenant is to sustain man's life in this world so that a redeemer might come, so that Jesus might go to the cross for sin. God's character never changes. That's the other thing that this sign communicates about God. God's character never changes. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is faithful in every generation. He is both merciful and just. Many of the older writers will mention this, that the rainbow communicates just this very thing, that it requires both light, sunshine, and clouds. Signs of glory, signs of judgment, signs of grace and judgment at the same time. It requires both things. God is both gracious and merciful and just and holy, on the other hand. It is is God who who looks upon the sign. It is God who looks, and it is God who remembers his word. And so the promise does not depend on man, but it depends on God. Look what God says in, in verse 15. I will remember... Verse 14, it shall be when when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud and I will remember my covenant which is between you and every living creature of all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud, verse 16, and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. It's like every other sign or seal that God gives. God is the one who determines what it means. And God is the one who is acting in history when that sign is displayed. And so the sign seals an accomplished fact, just like circumcision sealed an accomplished fact. But unlike circumcision, there's no human activity associated with this sign. The rainbow is utterly out of man's reach, as it were, because God's covenant is going to endure forever. God's covenant of grace for perpetual generations, or that might, be, that might also be rendered for generations of eternity. The Hebrew word olam, that word signifies the enduring character of God's covenant. God is a God of eternity. God is a God of olam. That same word appears in the covenant made with Abraham in Genesis 17. This is a perpetual covenant. doesn't mean that that nothing changes when a new covenant comes along and there's, an administ- there's a new administration of the covenant. Sometimes things change, but God never changes. And God's purposes in history never change. His purposes in the covenant of grace never change. His purposes in Jesus Christ never change. This covenant is so permanent and so irrevocable that it is called an everlasting covenant, in verse 16. That should comfort our hearts. As long as God is in heaven, as long as Christ is at God's right hand, as long as the Spirit is your indwelling comforter, God's covenant will stand. He says, I will remember, verse 15. God has already said that back in verse 8, or back in chapter 8. Do you remember that? Chapter 8, verse 1, then God remembered Noah. He didn't forget. He remembered Noah because he remembered his covenant. He had made a covenant with Noah. He uses the same language when he speaks to Israel. He says, I will remember the covenant made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I heard your groaning in Egypt, and I remembered my covenant. I remembered who I was, and I saved you. God knows that you and I are weak. God knows that we are prone to forget. But God never forgets his word. God never forgets his works. And so what are we to do? We're to remember that God is a God who never forgets. He never forgets. As long as the sun and the moon and the stars shine in the sky, every time you see a rainbow after a storm, you remember that God is your God that God is our God, that Christ is your Christ, that Christ is our Christ, that heaven is open to sinners who come in faith. Even more, every time you see the signs of baptism and the Lord's Supper administered, remember what God has done for you in Christ. And as you remember what God has done for you in Christ and you remember his promises, you cry out to him for grace to live no longer 
under the shadow of sin and death and the curse, but to live under the rainbow of God's faithfulness and of His love. So God gave Noah and his descendants a promise. He connected to that promise a sign, that sign, the rainbow. What do you think of when you see a rainbow? Do you think of the character and promise of God? Do you think of the beauty and the glory of the cross? That place where the light of God's grace was refracted and diffused in the very storm of God's wrath upon His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. May we live each moment of our lives looking by faith to Christ, whose light is more brilliant and whose glory is more glorious than all the rainbows this world's light will ever produce. Let us pray. O gracious God and Father, we thank you for your covenant. We thank you for the covenant that you made long ago with Noah. We thank you for the way that that covenant points us forward to the eternal covenant of grace. We thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, who is crowned with glory and honor, who sits at your right hand, who is the sum and substance of all that was promised in the old covenant, who is the sum and substance of all of the promises that you have ever made in history. Help us, O Lord, to trust in him, to live for him, to walk with him, to commune with you through him. And help us, Lord, to be faithful witnesses of the gospel in this world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our psalm of response this morning is number 104a, verses 8 